with my talk is that good? Uh, Yay. <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Faina. Thank you for hanging out on the last talk of the day. It's been a really great couple days with a lot of information. Um, so I hope you're all awake. I hope I can keep this interesting enough to keep you awake. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Faina. I lead the layer two tooling and um, layer two and scaling team at Truffle. Uh, so we build tools to help developers develop for layer two. Uh, as most of you probably know, layer two has been around for roughly a year, a little longer, a little longer than a year. Uh, so I kind of fell down that rabbit hole back in January of last year and haven't really come back up for air since. Uh, back then, there weren't even any test nets yet. And what a difference a year makes. Uh, now we're all here and we have lots of theories about how things should be structured and we have lots of layer two protocols to choose from, which means we have a lot more tooling needs. Uh, so I'm hoping today to talk a bit about what I have learned in building tooling over the past year and also where I think that we're going and what the unmet needs are. Uh, so when we're evaluating the level two, the layer two tooling ecosystem, uh, I want to level set here because it is not just about the protocol layer. So I think initially when I started looking at building tooling, I thought, well, I just have to make sure that we play nice with some new op codes in some of these layer two protocols. Uh, but it is so much more than that. And I don't think that we can say that we have a robust tooling ecosystem for layer two if we're not considering the context around those protocols. So I'm talking about validators and secret sequencers and provers and the fault or fraud proof mechanism, uh, which obviously is different for each chain, uh, cross chain communication, bridges, all those pieces require tooling and require the developers that are deploying for layer two to understand those pieces and how they contribute to the security of their DAP and the experience of their users. So, over the past few years, I think we've really solidified what the mainnet developer workflow looks like. Uh, you, you write your code, you test it, you compile it, you deploy it, you monitor it, and we have tons of tools available, and it's growing every day in order to do that. So I'm sure you've heard of some of those tools, Truffle, where I work, uh, Hard Hat, um, Alchemy and Fura, right, Remix. We have all of these tools to make it clearer to us what's actually happening under the hood, make it easier for us to create these decentralized applications in a secure way and deploy them to mainnet. Uh, it's a little bit different for layer two. Uh, so what does the layer two workflow look like? Uh, I will say that it's still developing. I think at its most basic, uh, most complex dApps that are deployed on layer twos are actually not just on the layer two. They need to be aware of contracts that exist on mainnet. They need to be aware of their bridging options. They might need to send messages. So this, this slide is actually not sufficient. Uh, neither really is this one, but it's a little bit closer. Uh, there's a lot of interaction between the different layers, and there's a lot that developers need to be aware of when deploying to a layer two, aside from just that protocol. Uh, so this is very much still in flux. As I'm sure everyone in this room is aware, this changes a lot. The layer two ecosystem changes, I feel like, week to week. I remember early last year trying to build some tooling and then turning around and looking at one of the repos for one of the protocols, and it had completely changed over a week. Uh, it's, it's gotten a little bit more stable, but that's definitely still an experience to have. Uh, so this might change, and I think it is changing, and we're still trying to figure out what this workflow looks like and what layer two developers are going to need that is different from layer one. Uh, the current layer two tooling landscape actually looks really good for deploying to a layer two protocol. Uh, we have many tools that can be easily transitioned to supporting layer two applications. Uh, you can deploy with maybe minimal changes. Maybe you just need to change the RPC endpoint. Uh, so that's great. You can compile smart contract code. You can test it. You can deploy it, especially for the EVM compatible or EVM equivalent chains. There are a lot of things that you can use out of the box when you decide, OK, I'm going to try to deploy to a layer two. And I think that's fantastic. Uh, but like I said, there's a lot more context there, and there are a lot of unmet needs that are starting to emerge that we need to consider. 
Uh, I will say, and I'll talk about this next, uh, debugging is a special case. I don't think that we really have parity right now uh, in the layer two space with what we have available on mainnet for debugging. And that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, chains that are not EVM compatible, they have to build debuggers, and that's a complicated task. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone here from Open Zeppelin's Nile team, uh, but they recently released uh, sort of their first attempt at debugging for StarkNet contracts, for Cairo contracts, so that's really exciting to see that that is starting to develop and we are starting to see tools in that sense. For EVM compatible chains, there is actually a non-standard RPC method that they can enable uh, called debug trace transaction that will make Truffle's debugger available. Truffle's debugger, in my opinion, again, I work at Truffle, uh, but I think it's first in its class. Uh, and it really lets you dive deep into what's happening in your contract on a transaction per transaction basis and just go step by step through it. Uh, if debug trace transaction is not enabled, you can't use Truffle debugger. Debug trace transaction returns a very large payload, uh, and if you do it multiple times, then you're just gonna overwhelm nodes. So it is actually a complicated problem, and something that we've solved at Truffle by allowing you to enable debug trace transaction in Ganache, and because Ganache allows, um, and Ganache is a local testnet, and uh, if, if you haven't heard of it, uh, that you can run locally on your computer to mimic mainnet, uh, and so, in Ganache, you can fork mainnet with zero config as of Ganache 7, uh, and that will let you then debug as though you're on mainnet, and you can really see what's happening in your contract and in your transactions. Unfortunately, at this time, Ganache can't really be used with the layer two protocols, uh, because if you fork Ganache, it assumes mainnet rules. So if there are additional rules, we don't have the capability to sort of import those into the ganache fork that you're using. I'll talk a little bit more about something we have coming up that will hopefully fix that. But in the meantime, what can layer, proto layer two protocols do to make debugging available? Uh, well, I think the easiest thing to do, uh, most of the protocols that I have seen actually have a Docker image that you can pull in uh, that runs a local test net. So it's a little bit like having a ganache locally. Uh, and so if you just change the code there uh, to enable debug trace transaction, it doesn't require a heavy load on your node operator because somebody's running this locally. I think that would be a very quick and easy fix. So if anybody is here listening, please uh, enable debug trace transaction in your Docker. Uh, and I actually heard yesterday that Optimism has enabled it. I haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but I'm really excited to do so um, and try out Truffle Debugger with it. So sorry for that aside. Thanks for running down that rabbit hole with me. Uh, but debugging is incredibly important for ensuring that your contracts are secure, for ensuring that you've really thought through all the possible bugs and the flow of your contract. And so I just wanted to make that aside to make sure that we're all aware of this particularly important problem. And uh, this is kind of the meat of my talk, which is our unmet tooling needs. Uh, I think that unless you are thinking about the developer's needs that are coming up, you kind of fall behind in this ecosystem because everything happens so quickly. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about what tools are developers going to need? What are the use cases that we don't really have adequate support for at this time, and there are actually quite a few. So at the top of this iceberg, you see a lot of the tools that we all know and love, uh, and they do provide a lot of help in onboarding developers, and a lot of them can be used with layer two protocols, uh, both EVM compatible and not, depending on the situation. But the things underneath the iceberg, the things that you don't see, I think they're starting to bubble up, and I think we're gonna see more and more of these items taking center stage and we're gonna need tools for developers to figure out how all of this works because the layer two space is complex, everything's interrelated and there are a lot of pieces. Uh, the first thing that I wanna talk about is UI and UX tooling. I think that when users are switching networks, we should work to standardize what that looks like from a UI and UX standpoint. I think we can do that with tooling because then DAP developers will use that tool, right, and hopefully streamline that process a little bit. It's scary when you're told for the first time, oh, you're switching a network, like open your MetaMask and approve switching this network. And then, you know, when you add bridging in, it's complicated. And so we want users to feel comfortable enough to use our layer two protocols, right? So we wanna make sure that that whole process is standard. So if I go to three different dApps and that process seems similar, hopefully if the fourth one looks different, I'll take a pause and think, oh, maybe there's something insecure here. On the other side of that is the idea of layer abstraction, uh, which I think is really interesting, uh, where really, we might not want users to know that they're switching networks. They've arrived on our DAP and they just wanna do a thing and they wanna do it as cheaply as possible and they don't really care what network they're on. 
that feels much further away. I don't think we're anywhere near really being able to do that in a meaningful way. But I think it's something we need to be thinking about because if as a community we feel like that is a UX goal, we want users to not even worry about what layer they're on and just it's all Ethereum, which is a nice goal and I think it's, it would be fun to make that happen. Uh, if we wanna do that, then we also need to be thinking about standardizing that flow and what does that look like? We don't really have interfaces for that right now. We can take a lot of that network switching and hide it from the user if we really want to and so how do we deal with the security issues with that and how do we streamline it, how do we st standardize it? I think those are things that we should really be thinking about. Uh, sequencer and validator monitoring, I mean, these are so new. These are still being developed. Some of them aren't live. Most of them aren't live. Uh, so for sequencers and validators, we want users and developers to know the level of security that their chain has, that they're deploying to. We want to, them to know, is the sequencer down? How often has the sequencer been down, right? Uh, and that's something, I was thinking about this yesterday and I've basically decided that L2Beat is a developer tool. Uh, I think that they are probably the best positioned to be the people that are monitoring these and sharing this information with developers and potentially with users. So, you know, I'm not saying it's a feature request, but I would really like that to happen. <laughs> uh, and then I also think that bridge interfaces are something that we need to work on. Uh, as we've heard a lot today, uh, there are many designs for bridges. There are many different security trade-offs for bridges. Uh, and as developers build more complex applications on layer two, they're going to be thinking more seriously about how are my users going to bridge their funds? How are they going to get them out? How am I going to ensure those funds are secure? Uh, I'm definitely not gonna talk about bridge design in this talk. Uh, I, that could be its own talk and so could bridge tooling, to be honest. Uh, but I think that we need to be thinking about what tools are we providing for developers to interact with existing bridges and possibly build their own bridges as well. Because I think a lot of the bridges right now that people are using uh, to get past the seven day delay for optimistic rollups and just to make it easier, right? A lot of those are centralized. A lot of them are based on a multi-sig. They are not secure enough. And I think that we need to be asking those questions. And from a tooling standpoint, we need to be asking those questions as well. We need to give developers the tools to ensure that the bridge that they tell their user to use is secure and that they understand what's happening when they move their money. Uh, and then multi-chain deployment management, I think is probably the biggest problem right now. Um, if you have tried to deploy a, a project on both layer one on the mainnet and a layer two, you have probably had to write a pretty long script to do it. You've had to figure out how do I get the address from the contract that I deployed on mainnet to the contract that I'm deploying on layer two and vice versa. Uh, and when you add the, all the complexities of super complex applications that are starting to arise and this space is maturing, we're going to have new applications that we're not even ready for, right? I mean, I think gaming is a big one. I think NFTs moving into layer twos, those are all gonna become more complex. Those are all going to require us to think about how do we handle multi-chain deployments. The tools that we currently have are almost, I think all of them, really look at a deployment as a single chain event. So you deploy something to one chain and then you deploy to another chain. And like I said, that, that means you're probably writing a really long and complicated script that you're annoyed by. And then if you fail halfway through, how are you maintaining your state? Do you have to start your deployment all over? How are you figuring out where things broke? Uh, so I think that a multi-chain deployment management system is one of the most urgent things that we need to work on. Uh, so good news, uh, we're working on a lot of that at Truffle. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we sort of started with in layer two, uh, with something we call truffle boxes. So a truffle box is boilerplate code. Uh, you just run it in your CLI once you have truffle installed. So uh, I, last year I built an Arbitrum box, an Optimism box, and a Polygon box. Those are all live. And so let's say you wanted to, run, to start a Polygon project or an Arbitrum project, right? You would run truffle unbox Arbitrum. And then now you have an entire boilerplate project. If anybody's used Rails, uh, Ruby on Rails, it's kind of like a Rails scaffold uh, where you just have this scaffolded project that has the directories that you need as well as a detailed readme with exactly how you would deploy to that chain and what things you should be looking out for as far as differences in op code, et cetera. So I've deployed some of those and they're available, but they're really just the beginning. And what we've been working on lately is more advanced use cases uh, with our boxes. So this is a, a little GIF of uh, one of the boxes we're working on. 
which is a bridge box. Uh, so we are working on making it so that developers can build their own bridges. And when I say build their own bridges, it's a little bit complicated because really we're interacting with existing bridge infrastructure uh, in Arbitrum, in Optimism. Uh, but we're making it so that developers really understand what's happening there. And the reason that we're starting with a box is because this space is changing every day. And we want to understand how are developers going to use this? What benefit is there for a developer to have this kind of granular control over sending messages between layers in their application, et cetera? Because this is not just value transfer, but also message passing. Uh, so I think that there are a lot of apps that I have seen recently where uh, you, know, you might not necessarily be building a bridge to bridge your ETH or your ERC-20s, but maybe you are trying to send a message from one layer to another. Uh, maybe you're checking if someone owns an NFT on mainnet so they can play your game on Polygon, for instance. Uh, so we want to give developers the opportunity to do that. And so the box is the first step in that direction. Uh, and we're hoping that it's going to lead to building of bridge interfaces that will actually incorporate inside of Truffle itself. So that's kind of the, the next step in the bridging Saga, I would say. Uh, we're also working on a StarkNet box. Uh, when I started looking at StarkNet, I wasn't sure how we would best uh, incorporate that into Truffle, because Truffle really does depend on an EVM. Uh, and so given that StarkNet is not EVM compatible, I didn't want, let me phrase that differently. I wanted to be sure that anything that we created would be useful to developers and be meaningful, and not just slapping Truffle around a Docker container. Uh, and so we've spent a lot of time working on understanding how StarkNet works under the hood and how we can incorporate it into Truffle. So I'm pleased to say that we will be releasing a StarkNet box. And that's also a first step. We have a couple of other ideas for how to incorporate StarkNet into Truffle. Uh, the boxes are a great way to get people started. And I think that's something we need right now. I mean, Layer 2 is growing really fast. You can see there's a lot of people at this conference who made the trip all the way to Amsterdam for it. But still, I think we want more adoption. We want more applications. And so getting people into a comfortable environment that they're used to, like Truffle, and giving them that boilerplate code, giving them the instructions for how to get started, I think is really important. Another thing that last year, every single protocol that I spoke with asked about Ganache. They want a protocol-flavored ganache, right? Optimism ganache, Arbitrum ganache. We all want it. I want it too. Um, it would solve our debugging problem. It would also help developers do something that they're already comfortable with, testing via ganache, right? So uh, that's something that we've been working on for a while. Uh, and we are starting to wrap up the infrastructure for ganache plugins. And once those are live, you will be able to have an Arbitrum ganache, an Optimism ganache, a StarkNet ganache uh, that will have the rules of that particular protocol baked in. It'll have the pre-compiled contracts that are necessary baked in. So you'll be able to test out what your deployment would look like. You'll be able to fork Arbitrum at this very moment and see how it will react to you deploying your contract. And you'll also be able to fork mainnet at the same time and see how cross-chain communication might work as well. And so that's something that we're really excited about. We've been working on it for a long time. Uh, Ganache 7 was released a few months ago. Uh, and that was kind of the first step in getting the, the architecture and the infrastructure working for Ganache plugins. So keep an eye on that space. I'm really excited to announce that when it's live. Um, and I think that's going to solve a lot of problems. I think it's going to let developers really understand what's happening when they deploy to layer two and when they try to send messages between layers. And declarative deployments, I'm hoping, will be the solution for uh, the multi-chain deployment problem. And so the goal here is, and I don't have a screenshot because front end is not my thing, so I haven't really worked on the UI part of this yet. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the gist is that you will tell Truffle what your completed application looks like, right? You're going to say, I will have deployed, when my, when my project is fully deployed, I will have deployed these contracts on mainnet. I will have deployed these contracts on layer two. Uh, this contract over here has a dependency on this contract over here. Truffle will order those deployments for you. It will maintain the state for you as you deploy each one. Uh, it will show you the plan of what it's going to deploy before you deploy in case you need to change something. Uh, and so it's going to take a lot of that guesswork out. You're not going to need that script anymore. You're just going to be able to tell Truffle, this is what I want. And Truffle will do the heavy lifting for you. And that's going to also allow you to maintain a knowledge of multiple networks at once. 
Currently, Truffle, if you just run deploy, you can't deploy to one, more than one network at a time. So that's going to be something that declarative deployments is going to address, which I think is really exciting. Um, it is my personal project right now, uh, and I'm working pretty hard at it, so I can't wait to show you all when it's ready. Um, we just this week released the new Truffle VS Code extension. Uh, Inside of it, you can basically do everything you can do in Truffle. So you can compile, you can debug, you can deploy, you can choose your network. Uh, and I am going to be helping to make VS Code extension, the Truffle VS Code extension, uh, incorporate all of these new tools that we are working on from the Layer 2 team. So declarative deployments will be part of the VS Code extension. Uh, Ganache plugins will be part of the VS Code extension. You'll be able to choose more than one network at a time in order to uh, do these multi-network deployments. Uh, so that's coming, it's gonna be a little while, we just released this version, but um, something to look out for as well to make the developer experience easier. And that's sort of what I'm trying to do here, is make it so that people want to deploy to layer two. It doesn't seem like something so hard or so complicated, and instead feels relatively similar to mainnet with a few things you need to be aware of. And I also wanna talk about Truffle Dashboard, which we released, uh, I wanna say, maybe January. Um, Truffle Dashboard, if you haven't tried it, and if you get nervous when you, sell, when you save your private key or your mnemonic in your .n file, and you're like, oh gosh, I hope nobody accidentally commits this to GitHub, right? Or I hope there's no bug on my computer that's waiting to see my private key. Uh, you no longer have to do that. You can spin up your Truffle project, run Truffle Dashboard, and use this UI to connect to your wallet. I think we support MetaMask and Wallet Connect right now, and that probably will expand. Uh, and so you no longer need to save your mnemonic anywhere. So it's, I think, a huge, right? It's a, it's a huge... <laughs> It's a huge security win. Um, that's a really scary thing. Every time I deploy something and I have my private key saved, I just feel a little nervous. Um, and so it sounds like I'm not the only one. Uh, so try out Truffle Dashboard. Uh, and what we're going to do is implement our multi-network approach uh, to Truffle Dashboard as well. So it's all kind of going to happen together and it's all connected, but it's aiming to solve these big new problems that I think didn't really exist in the same way before layer two. Uh, so those are some of the things we're working on in Truffle to sort of get us to a point where developers can come in and have this really clear roadmap. I want to deploy to layer two because gas savings or whatever. I want to deploy a really complicated game that didn't make sense in mainnet, right? Developers should have a path to do that and they should be aware of all of the context around just that basic deployment that they're used to on the mainnet level. And so I'm hoping that all of these tools will sort of get us there. Um, just final thoughts, this ecosystem changes literally every day. Um, I feel like I spend 90% of my time just trying to get caught up on what happened and then 10% actually writing code to address the things that I've seen. Uh, so obviously everything I said could change literally next week, uh, but I think that if we start thinking at an ecosystem level and we start acknowledging that there are all of these interrelated pieces in the layer two ecosystem and it's not just deploying to a layer two protocol, then we can really start building these different tools that maybe we didn't think we needed before. Uh, and I hope that some of what I've talked about has sparked somebody's imagination here and you want to build some of this because we can't, I can't do it myself. Um, and the Truffle layer two team is three people. We can't do it ourselves which by the way, as everybody else has said, we are hiring. <laughs> so if you want to work on this, uh, feel free to chat with me. Uh, this is the Truffle Layer 2 team. Uh, we're all here today. I've added our Twitter handles if you wanna send any of us a DM about, either about working with us, but also if you have an idea for a, t a tool or you think I'm totally wrong about everything I've said, please tell me, uh, cause you never know, <laughs> right? So. Um, but that's basically my talk. Uh, I just wanted to sort of give you all an overview of what's been happening in the layer two tooling space because I do think that unless you're building the tooling, you might not be seeing what's coming down the pike. And I think it's all really exciting and really interesting and everything we're working on is hopefully just gonna make the developer experience that much easier. Thanks everyone. Uh, questions? 24 minutes. I'm only one minute shy and I'm 25. Hi, Fina. Hi. Great, great talk. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am at Open Zeppelin. I'm, I'm Jonathan. Oh, I'm CTO at Open Zeppelin. Awesome. Um, <laughs> and super excited about declarative deployments. Yeah. 
we'd love to find out more whenever you're going to share the format yeah. because we'd yes. love to collaborate on that. We are thinking about that, working about that. And by the way, just for you, the Truffle team, we're, we did do Nile. We're doing the Nile work. We don't <laughs> really have enough bandwidth to work on developer tooling. So we're actually way more interested to collaborate on 100%. the developer tooling. So yeah. we'd love to talk to you about that. And bridging also, you may have heard yesterday, we're, we've been working with the teams that were proposing some stuff. And we're, we're actually, we have some stuff in review for contracts for standardized messaging oh, on great. bridging that you can look at. It's posted for the latest release of Open Zeppelin contracts. And... Um, and it also has support for um, uh, roles-based access control across bridges, which is a complex issue. So we'd love to collaborate on that too. So that would be amazing. Yeah. And I, I didn't say. But um, uh, if you, I was wondering when were you going to? The question was, are you going to um, share the art, the declarative? And that's exactly uh, <clears throat> so I absolutely will right now the format we're basing it off of is super basic because I want to have an MVP ready and then start adding the more complex cases like upgradable contracts and that sort of thing. So the, it's going to be quite basic, but I very much would like us to have a standard. I think if we as a community can come together and have this is what a declaration looks like in this space, then that means people can take that declaration from tool to tool and use whatever they want. Right. So collaboration and not competition. I'm all about that that so I, I love that please let's chat let's set up a meeting because I think that would be fantastic yeah. any other questions okay thanks uh, everybody